አብያር ትራኳ ሃሪሚ ወጽ የማለት ነው ታደረ ነው ሃሪሚ ወጽ ንሱዳን ከሄደ ማለት ነው ካፍ ሱዳን ካኒ ጫፍ ሱዳን ማለት ነው how i go to egypt in sinai in sinai in the one month like two months yeah the prison they they kidnapped by the uh, organ harvesters also uh, there is a lot of it i'm lucky i'm arriving to try Israel uh, is, is given money. Eh? How much? Three thousand five hundred dollar. Mm -hmm. Come on the Rwanda. This is Najana Nkumbi, a suburb in Uganda's capital, Kampala. An enclave associated with Eritrean refugees. Many found themselves here, but this is not the better future they dreamt of when they took the precarious journey, escaping the indefinite military service in their home country, Eritrea, with hope of a better future in Israel. Former Eritrean High Court judge, Muluberam Berhe, is one of the many Eritreans who fled. An author of many books on legal and human rights matters, Berhe lives in exile in Uganda. The majority of the youth are members of the National Service. And the National Service, according to the law, was supposed to be one month, one year and six months, 18 months. But you see now still, for almost 20 or more years, still members of the National Service. Every member of the youth, starting from 18 until 55. So this, uh, it means they in the productive member of the Eritrean society. Everybody has to be there. And this is legal obligation. The first six months is military training, and the rest one year is supposed to be serving anywhere where the government places you. But after one, month, one year and six months, supposed to go to normal life. But things are not going like that. So, they are forced so the government them. say, because there is no peace, no, no war, no peace, we have always a threat from Ethiopia. We need the army ready. While the U.S. want us, no, we cannot stay in the army for our life. Yeah. We need to use our opportunity. We need to see the life. We need to get married. We need to start life. Start life. This is the problem. An arduous journey starts with crossing into the Sudan with two options. The first one is the hope of crossing into Libya, sail across the Mediterranean, and seek asylum in Europe, while the other is to go via Egypt through the Sinai Desert to seek asylum in Israel. The majority of Eritreans usually take the route to Israel. Twenty-eight-year-old Samuel, not his real name, fled Eritrea in 2008, spent four years on the perilous journey before making it to Israel in 2012. Thirty-eight-year-old Jonas, not his real name, served in the army 
for 10 years before he decided to flee Eritrea for Israel in 2008. He trekked through the Sudan and spent two years in Khartoum before taking a decision to head for Israel in 2010. 31-year-old Mebratu, not his real name, left Eritrea in 2008. He had served in the military for six years. For purposes of safeguarding their safety, their real names have not been disclosed. for us to go to Kassala, after Kassala five days, and after that I will go to Egypt and Sinai. Sinai in the one month, like two months, yeah, in the prison. Why did they put you in the prison? Because of, uh, with uh, our agreement, the money, 3,200 in the Khartoum. Eh? Then you go to the Egypt, for, uh, you ask that uh, Egyptian, 15,000. At that time, I mean, I don't have money. If you have put in the prison, eh? you ask for the brothers and friends, and from Eritrea, my mom is selling the gold, you know. All sell it, you pay for me. You see, all this one is broken, still now. Why? If you don't, if you, if you don't pay, eh? every morning, you beat for me. Not only me, too much Eritrea here. Yeah. I was a soldier in Eritrea. Then I was moving 2008, I'm coming to Sudan. Then I was going to Israel. Going from Sudan to Israel, I was in Sinai two months. Then I get in Israel. But there is too much problem, you know, that it, is a, it was a desert. So there is no eating, there is no drink, two months. It was very hard. Then but God helped me, and I know I got Israel. I was in Russia, 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 I I'm going to go to the hospital. 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 I'm going to go to
This is South Tel Aviv, an area in the Israel capital with a large number of Eritrean asylum seekers. It is here at the Levinsky Park that those who make it into Israel are released on the streets and left with no hope to seek asylum. As they wait for their asylum status to be determined, they embark on the adulterous task of finding work and place to live. Bereke took the long journey through Sudan and Egypt, paying ransom of 2,500 US dollars before finally making it to Tel Aviv. So when I arrived, they put me in the prison to check me medical situation and uh, who am I and uh, what for I'm coming. After they interviewing me, checking my medical condition, they took me out after 15 days to the the bus station of Be'er Sheba. They gave me a ticket to Tel Aviv. And then I came to Tel Aviv to live in a ski park. And then my situation, my life start from that time, uh, self survival. Uh, they don't support me, just they give me a conditional visa. Uh, as well, but it's uh, like a prohibit to work, the visa condition. Like many asylum seekers, Bereket found himself work to enable him to survive. The only work available for refugees who have not been granted a permit to work. Still we are working cleaning the fritters, cleaning the dishes. Uh, we are not working in the profession. We are not working in the offices. Even we are not allowed to study higher education. So they expect us like a poor and lower classes people. Although these asylum seekers were left to work, some for longer than five years, their status of stay in Israel was never defined. This left them vulnerable for abuse by employers seeking cheap undocumented workers. I'm working here on the welder. I broke my hand that, that time. After, I'm working here after one year and the, and the job. I broke this one, I got to the hospital. It's not even money for the, for the hospital for me. And some friends, you give that collects the money, you give the hospital the money. I have too much money in Israel hospital. But my friends is good at that time, collect the money for the patients. Even at that job, I working three years and two months at that place, in the welder. $18,000 is not given. In December 2017, the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, passed a law to deport illegal African migrants against their will. There are approximately 38,000 African asylum seekers in Israel, according to the Interior Ministry. About 75% are Eritreans and 20% Sudanese. The vast majority arrived between 2006 and 2012 by crossing the border from Egypt. Israel considers the vast majority of asylum seekers to be job seekers, economic migrants whose lives were not in danger in their countries of origin, and says it has no legal obligation to keep them. According to this law, Israel could transport a large number of asylum seekers by branding them illegal migrants to an African country willing to accept them. The Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is a global organization that works to promote emancipatory political forces and to strengthen democratic and social rights for people. Through its office in Israel, the organization has been supporting local Israeli organizations and activists who oppose seeing refugees and asylum seekers as a threat to Israel. We are fighting in order to first to acknowledge the rights uh, of asylum rights in Israel and to uh, grant the, the communities that are at the moment here the basic rights they need in order to rehabilitate. Uh, but as I said before, this is a political struggle. So we're actually struggling to change the character uh, or the, the, uh, uh, to change the policies in Israel towards non-Jewish migrants and to enable a much more heterogeneous uh, understanding of what is citizenship and to enable, in this sense, a process in which um, 
both asylum seekers and migrants have the, the future possibilities of becoming part of the Israeli society. So this is why this is a very uh, deep, sensitive topic and in, uh, in a struggle within the Israeli society. The issue of undefined status of asylum seekers made some resistance from opposition members of parliament. My name is Michal Rosin. I'm a member of the parliament for Merit's party. This is my second term in the Knesset. Uh, in the last Knesset, in the former Knesset, I was the head of the Foreign uh, Workers Committee in the Knesset and dealt a lot with the issue of the asylum seekers, as the Israeli government called them the infiltrators. The government of Israel decided not to recognize the asylum seekers, the migrants, as refugees. They prefer to give them a protection, if they call it, um, from deportation. We will not give them asylum seeker uh, uh, status, we will not give them a uh, refugee status, but we will not deport them to their countries or to other countries and they, we will let them stay here but without any legal status, without any privilege. With over 27,000 Eritreans and 7,700 Sudanese in Israel whose status remained undecided, coupled with unfavorable working conditions, it was only a matter of time before it would create tension that would soon boil over. Asylum seekers started to demand for clear definition of their stay as provided for by the International Convention to which the State of Israel is signatory. We came in Israel seven years ago and we did all that is possible asking the state to give us a stay to deal us as a refugees who come from catastrophic areas such as like Darfur, Gilmail, Nuba Mountains, those who came from Eritrea. But so within seven years, the state didn't recognize us at all. Every day we are just having a problem with different, with the different situation. They call us infiltrators and everything like criminals. In 2015, I submit this paper. Still I'm waiting for uh, interview. They gave me an appointment on 26th of March 2008. I don't have any hope from this interview. 99.9% .9 is rejected. Uh, 10 people accepted by Israeli government as a refuge from Eritrean community. Uh, 27,000 is without status. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu toured South Tel Aviv area to assess for himself the situation. He assured the residents of his government's readiness to read the area of the asylum seekers. Refugees that came from Egypt are, uh, are called in Israel infiltrators. This is a very negative connotated uh, term that is driven from history. This, this is the term that was used against Palestinians after 48 that tried to either come back to their houses or revenge the loss um, of their houses. And this is a, an attempt to already portray them in a, negative, uh, in a negative light, trying to supposedly come and exploit Israeli democracy. And uh, through, the, through this term and the legislation against infiltrators, Israel is able to put all these restrictions and make their life unbearable while referring only to African asylum seekers and not naming it as such. Government acted quickly by employing high-handed measures to nip this problem in the bud and avoid taking responsibility. When the government decide to um, establish, to form a detention facility and to put and to legislate a law that can uh, detain the refugees, the asylum seekers in a, a detention facility in the middle of the desert for three years without any trial, without any uh, procedures, just putting them there for three years 
and the purpose of it was to just you know make them life miserable and make them live uh, by them by themselves and we started to struggle against that uh, infiltrators laws uh, there were appeals by the uh, um, human rights organization to the Supreme Court uh, to cancel the law and we fought against it in the Knesset against the legislation and at the end uh, the Supreme Court uh, three times or three times canceled the, uh, the law of infiltrators and uh, told the government you cannot put people in prison for three years without any trial and all their you know all their uh, crime is uh, trying to get a better life for themselves. Meantime, the media was awash with reports about the secret arrangement to have the asylum seekers relocated to a third country. Rwanda and Uganda were mentioned as destination countries, allegations which Uganda government vehemently denied. That is not true. That is uh, unfounded uh, uh, information and we, we do not know where it originated from. I'd like to make it very clear today, for the record, that we have no written, verbal, or any form of agreement with Israel to host refugees who are rejected, deported, or fled Israel to come to Uganda. The matter was brought before the Parliament of Uganda by members from the opposition who sought government's clarification. This mounted additional pressure on government to make the process more transparent. The media reports that Israel was proposing to send refugees to Uganda and Rwanda and it will meet some costs. The cost they are going to meet was unclear whether it was going to be cost of transportation, whether it was going to be the cost uh, of hosting these people where they were sending them. In fact, for me at the beginning, that was the issue I raised in the parliament. I was concerned because you see, uh, the government as an institution, every single shilling that is given to the Ugandan government must be declared. So I wanted to ask them to explain, what, first of all, if you are going to receive these people, two, if Israel is going to give us money, where is the money, and what arrangement do we get that money? So at the beginning, that was my, my question. I actually thought that government was in, in some sort of negotiation with Israel. But when the reports appeared in the media, they denied that these people are here. When I raised it in parliament, they denied. Before the government goes into any memorandum of understanding with any other country, there is parliamentary approval that is required. So for that matter, as for now, there is no approved memorandum of understanding between the government of Uganda, at least as far as parliament is concerned. If there are individuals within government that have acted on behalf of government without parliamentary approval, then the individuals will have an answer. Because that would lead to trafficking in persons. As the pressure continued to mount, the government of Uganda reinstated their earlier position. The minister in charge of disaster preparedness addressed the press conference, admitting an arrangement with the state of Israel to relocate and process asylum seekers to Uganda. The above, the state of Israel, working with other refugee managing organizations, has requested Uganda to allow about 500 <coughs> refugees of Eritrean and Sudanese descent or, or origin to be relocated to Uganda. I want to make it abundantly clear that the government and my ministry are positively considering this request. And it's important to note that all the relocatees <coughs> shall have to undergo a rigorous verification process under what we call a, a refugee eligibility assessment to find their status so that they can be granted asylum in our country. But he insisted that the relocation process was yet to start and no funds have been paid to the government of Uganda. That already we have 1.4 million refugees here in Uganda. We have not been paid a cent. In fact, it is us spending our limited resources to make sure that we make them have a second home here in Uganda. So there is no payment attached to this. It is purely humanitarian. 
the eligibility committee is standing by just to receive the first batch and we'll make it public. When they come, you'll we'll see them and we'll process them through the assessment and those who will meet our criteria will certainly be granted asylum immediately. Under the shadows, a number of asylum seekers who fled originally to seek asylum in Israel are being brought to Uganda under circumstances akin to human trafficking. Once they arrive in Uganda, they are unable to claim refugee status due to the manner in which they are relocated. At one of the government's weekly meetings in Jerusalem, Benjamin Netanyahu briefed his cabinet that the refugees who he referred to as infiltrators were already being shipped out of Israel. Though Uganda has a favorable refugee policy, taking in the bark of refugees from its volatile neighboring countries, totaling close to 1.5 million fleeing conflicts in Congo, Burundi, Somalia and South Sudan, to attain refugee status in Uganda, one has to be subjected to verification process, a procedure that is done in conjunction with the UN bodies dealing with refugee affairs like the UNHCR. Those who come to the country under unclear circumstances are unlikely to meet the eligibility criteria. All those who gain access to the country through forests, through lakes, once found, they are subjected to the law. They are treated as illegal immigrants and as such prosecuted. The Eritrean community in Uganda has formed a lobby organization to present the issue of Eritrean relocated to Uganda under the cover of darkness to the government of Uganda. They hope that lobbying through a joint effort may get the attention of government officials and change the fate of their colleagues brought to Uganda under illegal circumstances. The legal dilemma when they are put here, they are neither migrants nor refugee, so they are stateless legally. They are stateless. They don't have a document to say that they are, or they are, although they are origin Eritrean or South Sudanese or Sudanese, they don't have the document to show that they are from this country. It's only their physic, physically, okay, or their language. The Ugandan government has not accepted them as an asylum seeker. And legally, sir, cannot be accepted as an asylum seeker. You see, asylum, who is asylum seeker? Asylum seeker is somebody fleeing from some kind of danger, whether it is a political, ethnic, religion, uh, discrimination, name it whatsoever. But these people are coming from a plane with no document. <laughs> huh? Legally, how would the government of Uganda accept them as refugee or asylum seeker. Legally, it's very difficult even for the government of Uganda. Human rights lawyer Laudislaus Rakafuzi has taken interest in the issue. He oversees his attempts to offer pro bono legal services to one of these deported asylum seekers have been frustrated. I need, what I had planned to do is to seek a declaration that these people are refugees here and they should be protected with some aid. They should be given settlement, some land, some food, and that kind of thing. That's what I wanted to do. But this person eluded me, and many others I would have helped have all eluded me. The International Organization for Migration 
IOM office in Uganda, the UN body mandated to do third-party relocation of refugees has not been approached to address the issue. Uh, in many countries when the government has, um, has, uh, uh, is faced with a situation like this or is undertaking repatriation of some form, they do, again, uh, they do request uh, IOM or other, other, other partners to, uh, to assist. In this particular case, IOM has not been, we've not been asked to. So at this particular case, the, the, the information we have is quite scant. It's only what we've seen in the media and what we've, uh, uh, what we've seen in the statements that the government has issued. Say, say no to deportation. Persistent protests in Israel by Eritrean and South Sudanese asylum seekers, with the support of Israel community opposed the deportation, kept the issue of repatriation in the limelight. An anti-deportation rally held in Tel Aviv drew a crowd of over 20,000 people. At the same time, there is an ongoing court battle to overturn the decision to deport refugees to countries already saddled with low incomes, while overflowing with refugees from conflict-prone regions. In addition, questions about whether third-party countries are accepting money in exchange for the transfer have also not gone away. On March 12th, 2018, the Israel High Court of Justice temporarily froze the deportation and ordered the government to address some of the legal issues surrounding its expulsion policy. In March 2018, the Rosa Luxembourg Stiftung facilitated a fact-finding delegation from Israel that comprised two Israel parliamentarians and representatives of legal organizations to Rwanda and Uganda on a mission to gather information about the situation of refugees who are allegedly deported to the third countries by the Israel government. Their fact-finding mission was to verify the conditions under which asylum seekers were being relocated, confirmed that indeed Eritreans and South Sudanese were already being deported to the region illegally. We felt that the government is not telling us the truth. We felt that the government not only not telling us as member of parliament, but they are not telling the Supreme Court the truth. We knew that there was some kind of secret agreement with Rwanda government because Netanyahu just told everyone in a press conference that Rwanda is one of the country that we gonna deport by force people. We don't need the agreement of the um, asylum seeker. We just gonna deport them. And we knew that they provide for the Supreme Court some kind of an agreement that the Supreme Court said, if that's the agreement, so we will approve it. And we couldn't see that agreement and we decided to go by, by ourselves to check it out. What kind of status are they going to have there? We went to Rwanda and we saw that uh, all the asylum seekers who left Israel to Rwanda uh, moved to Uganda a few days later. So we try to understand what is their situation in Uganda, uh, what are they doing there, if they have any possibility to work, do they stay in, in Uganda or do they move to other places. And uh, we saw a terrible situation that actually most of them cannot work legally. Uh, we saw a terrible situation that uh, many of them uh, have hope, of course, and try to reach Europe and some of them died in the desert and we even saw uh, refugees who came back to their uh, states with all the risk uh, in that. They are very vulnerable. They cannot report a case at police because their status is not defined. They, 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 anything can happen to them. They can be called terrorists, they can be called anything. In April 2018, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu succumbed to local and international pressure by overturning the plan to deport 38,000 African migrants living in Israel. At a press conference in Tel Aviv, he admitted that the deportation scheme had actually been launched and executed, but later hit a snag due to local and international pressure. <laughs> Ladies and 
ביקרתי בלילות, אריה דרעי ואני עשינו אפילו סיור סמוי בלילות וראינו את, ראינו את בלוא הבעיה ואמרנו שאנחנו חייבים להוציא את היתרה שנמצאים שם. כדי להוציא אותם הייתה בעיה משום שבית המשפט הלכה למעשה אסר עלינו להוציא אותם למדינה שאינה מוכנה לקבל אותם ללא הסכמתם וכדי להתגבר על הבעיה הזאת היינו צריכים לחפש, וחיפשתי מדינה, ועמלתי על כך קשה מאוד, שתסכים לקבל את האנשים הללו בלי שהם יסכימו לעבור אליה. זו הייתה פריצת דרך, חשובה מאוד, נתנה לנו הרבה מאוד תקווה. התחלנו להוציא אנשים אליה. אבל מהר מאוד התברר שהמדינה השלישית הזאת איננה עומדת בתנאים, איננה עומדת בלחץ. ולכן מן הרגע שהתברר בשבועות האחרונים שהמדינה השלישית כאופציה לא קיימת, אנחנו למעשה נכנסנו למלכודת שאומרת שכולם היו נשארים. זה המשמעות. היינו מחכים לתשעה בחודש, לבג"ץ, והבג"ץ היה אומר לנו, אין לכם מדינה שלישית, ולפיכך כולם, בלי יוצא מן הכלל, כ-35,000 איש, כולם נשארים. אתה לא יכול לעשות כלום. לא ויתרנו שוב. This implies that the status of Eritreans and South Sudan asylum seekers in Israel remains largely unchanged with the Israel government unable to push through with their official deportation, while on the other hand, deferring, regionalizing their stay. And I think something was shifted, was shifted in the mind of the government and of course the public and that started uh, um, started a movement in all this issue we know that after we came back uh, the head of the um, um, department in the Minister of Interior Affairs traveled after us to the same countries we know that the Supreme Court started to ask difficult question to, to the government so we know we made a change Uh, at the end, they, um, I think what helped us is also that the Rwanda government decided not to go on with that agreement and they uh, took it back and, and hopefully uh, they won't be deported uh, by force uh, from here to any country. I'm happy to say that nine days after our visit, the government uh, uh, told uh, or sent a message to the Israeli government that they will not accept uh, refuge, refugees or asylum seekers coming from Israel. I, I don't know how much of this was uh, because our trip, maybe 0%, maybe 100%, probably a few percent, but uh, it was an outcome of the protest in Israel. It was an outcome uh, of uh, the policy that uh, tried to put the African governments of Rwanda and Uganda in a way that they collaborate with the Israeli government in a very unmoral uh, move. We were happy that at the moment the threat of deportation is off the table, but since we know that no, no real profound changes are taking place in policies, at the moment we are actually in a limbo, waiting to see what will be the next move of the Israeli government. In the meantime, the fate of asylum seekers who remain in Israel is still undetermined, with very slim chances of being granted asylum status. This implies that their dream of finding a safe place to live, work and enjoy basic human rights still hangs in balance. And as for those spirited away back to Africa under the cover of darkness, they continue to face a grim and uncertain future. Having already applied for asylum in Israel, they cannot be granted refugee status in a country in Africa. Without any identification of any sort, they are rendered stateless in the new country where they continue to live in the shadows. Out of desperation, the other option is to risk taking the perilous journey across the Mediterranean to Europe.